Okay. Thanks for joining our section, and thanks for sacrificing your time uh, with the theater time uh, in the Saturday afternoon. So thank you. Uh, this section will be conducted in English because um, uh, Joe is much easier for him. So uh, if you need a simultaneous um, interpretation, please um, get your headset over outside. Uh, we will um, use English to speak. If you need, you can get some people to all right, uh, with no more um, delay, uh, let me introduce our panel today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to miss, uh, introduce Ms. Ada Wong, uh, which is the one in the middle. Um, she's the founder and uh, honorary chief executive of Hong Kong Institute of Contemporary Culture. But um, after all, I think all of you know Ada. Uh, she's a very clear icon of the cultural development in Hong Kong. And he's also, uh, she's also very in, um, active in the education sector. Uh, long-term friends of SGHK, we have a lot of uh, things collaborate together. So uh, secondly, I would like to introduce uh, Joe, Joseph, uh, Joseph O'Connor. <laughs> and um, he is the uh, CEO of uh, CSL Limited. And then uh, she, uh, he has been with uh, a lot of different um, uh, technology conglomerate, global conglomerate uh, like uh, 3S and um, uh, Nokia before. So a very strong business background, but uh, actually CSL has done a lot of tremendous, thi uh, tremendous um, number of things on social, social side of things. I will, I'll leave some some of the time to Joe to introduce some of them. Um, very interestingly, many corporate are doing something uh, like a volunteering or just donating money, but them are using a lot of their core competence, their business to incorporate into the society's um, uh, social issues. So I think it is a very interesting case that uh, we have Joe to um, elaborate to us today. And uh, last but not least, we have Annie Chan. Um, she was a lawyer, and then, uh, but now is actually man uh, helping to manage uh, uh, her own uh, family office. And then, um, but she is one of the very forward-looking uh, investors in Hong Kong. Um, all, the, all the time, uh, she has been talking about sustainability. So that's one very clear word of her. Um, and she is going to talk to us about um, uh, how she is uh, approaching sustainability as an issue, how she managed her own portfolio uh, and, and as a whole. Uh, I think this will be a very uh, interesting case for us. So uh, I think going back to uh, our topic, um, leadership. I think leadership is, uh, if we talk about leadership, is changing path of some of the um, things happening in our society. I think social leadership that we want to focus today would be um, um, making up the change towards a better world of us today. So I think um, a lot of things that we talked about this morning would be very um, from the political perspective, from the um, top-down perspective. But now, actually, um, there are a lot of people in the society are doing something with no authority, no power at hand, but they are doing tremendously um, um, great work in changing our society. I think some of them are sitting on our panel today. So I will leave some time for them to elaborate how you as an individual uh, with your um, influence around you to make some positive impact to our society. And then um, I think um, also for leadership, I think this morning uh, Professor Dean William has said that um, it's about um, death. So leaders leading you to something, some place it's not, it's very risky, dangerous. Actually not a lot of leaders know where to go by the time they are doing something. But I think um, a lot of people like them in the society uh, have the courage to start doing something, the action-based model. So I think this is something that we want all of you to take away uh, before you're leaving the club. Okay, so um, uh, I think uh, for now, I would like to invite Annie to be our first speaker to talk about uh, how she is doing the things um, from an investment, investor perspective. I think, um, thank you very much, Annie. Um, good afternoon. Um, uh, I have to say that I'm, I'm certainly very honored to uh, be asked to participate um, uh, on a panel with uh, such very accomplished individuals um, who are all recognized leaders uh, in their respective fields. Um, and I, I asked myself why I'm actually uh, sitting uh, here in front of you, uh, because unlike other distinguished uh, uh, speakers at today's conference, um, many of whom you have uh, heard, I don't head a large organization. Uh, I have never held any public appointments, um, but I am a private indiv individual who is very keen to see a vibrant social entrepreneurship sector develop uh, in Hong Kong. 
And the reason is, um, I believe that uh, this development will help marshal more human capital and also more financial capital for the creation of uh, positive social and environmental value. Um, I have to say, you know, in, in my private conversations with uh, Francis, I do use the term sustainability a lot, um, but I just realized that uh, as I was preparing for today's uh, presentation, um, I actually am not using the word sustainability, but um, uh, it's certainly uh, a concept that um, kind of underlies uh, my approach to uh, investing. So in my time today, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, how I support the effort to grow this social entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem in Hong Kong. Um, and this is done through the intentional allocation of my capital resources and through investing for impact uh, and change. So like most people, um, I used to think that the world is bifurcated. Uh, you either go into the nonprofit world, uh, nonprofit sector um, and do good, or you go into the for-profit sector to do well. Um, you, use, you either use grants or donations to create social good, and you invest in markets or you run a business uh, to create financial wealth. But in reality, uh, this really isn't an either or choice. It is both and. So for example, uh, you can have a charitable foundation uh, that's managing uh, and investing millions of uh, dollars in endowment funds. Uh, and you have a for-profit who may be creating a lot of social good by providing employment and also by paying taxes, which are then used to support um, our social welfare. So, let's see. So between the extremes of for-profit and non-profit, there are actually a variety of organizations that may intentionally generate both financial and extra financial returns through the creation of social and or environmental benefits. So along this, uh, this spectrum uh, that you see on the screen, you have nonprofits that generate some income and particularly, let's see, yeah, sorry, we have a little bit of animation here. So within the, triang uh, the rectangular space, um, you see uh, that there are some on the, starting from the left-hand side, there are some nonprofits that generate some income by operating, uh, say, a shop that employs uh, disabled people uh, you have enterprises with a clear social mission that aims to be financially self-sustaining, uh, such as Diamond Cab. I think some of you may have had the chance to uh, visit uh, the uh, Diamond Cab demonstration outside. Uh, L plus H uh, Fashion, which uh, I understand is also a uh, sponsor of today's uh, conference. And then moving a little uh, further, you have businesses that are run in a socially uh, and res uh, environmentally responsible way. Uh, the body shop is a good example. Uh, and then there are also businesses that practice uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility, to varying degrees. And I'm sure CSL is one of those uh, that um, really try to uh, uh, incorporate um, a community aspect to uh, their business model. My personal interest is in uh, building more of these organizations that operate in the middle space. And the way that I do it is by looking at how best to capitalize these organizations. So turning to away from the organizations and focusing on the capital side of the conversation, what are the tools that are available to someone who wants to invest in the middle space? Oops. So besides making donations or grants to pure nonprofits, uh, or charitable organizations represented by the far left bubble, and investing in financially driven uh, businesses for market rate returns, uh, which is the far right bubble. An investor can do a whole range of things, and these can include extending loans to nonprofits, providing patient capital to social enterprises, and investing in socially responsible businesses. And while we're on the uh, capital conversation, what about the returns? What returns are we looking to generate? Traditionally, we think that investing for impact uh, involves trade-offs. The higher the social slash environmental value generated, the lower the expected financial return and vice versa. But in reality, most investing generates different degrees and combinations of each. So 
So in thinking about how one can invest for maximum impact, uh, there are two parts of a linked uh, equation. The first is how social and environmental factors actually influence financial performance. Um, one uh, example uh, that comes to mind is um, Swiss Re, a large uh, reinsurance um, uh, global company, um, and how it integrates climate change considerations into their insurance business model. Second part of the equation is how financial capital can be used to generate social and environmental value. So we have the example of uh, Diamond Cab. Uh, its uh, business model uh, is uh, uh, um, ingrained uh, uh, into a social mission to provide point-to-point -point transportation for um, the physically handicapped in Hong Kong, which is a sorely missing um, service. Um, you can also think about microfinance or producing solar lamps uh, for the rural poor. They all need uh, financial capital to make these things happen. And when you bring these two parts together, you create a portfolio that is generating multiple returns, social, environmental, and financial. And these combine together to create blended value. And here I have to give due recognition to uh, Jed Emerson, um, who is a uh, thought leader uh, in this area and coined the term blended value. Um, and for those of you who are interested, I uh, encourage you to go to his website and look up some of his papers. So um, I think very quickly, I want to give you some examples of um, how one can cover this whole spectrum of investment objectives and take some examples out of my own portfolio to share with you. So um, uh, matching the uh, spectrum of the bubbles uh, screen earlier, so now um, on the left side are some uh, grants and donat donations that I make. Um, I, uh, among other things, I uh, uh, support the uh, social enterprise um, summit because of my belief uh, in growing the sector in Hong Kong. Um, I also support uh, Grameen Foundation, which works in uh, microfinance. Um, CAN is a Clean Air Network, which is a, a nonprofit in Hong Kong focusing on um, uh, air issue. And of course, you know, my portfolio also uh, includes traditional investments, uh, cash, whatnot. But the interesting uh, space is really in the middle where all, um, it takes a lot of uh, attention um, and also work to build up this portfolio. Um, so on the um, left side of the middle uh, space, uh, um, there are investments that require some patient capital. In other words, uh, these are not necessarily investments that give you a return right away. It will take you a little bit extra time because these are unproven uh, concepts. They're all trying to do something new, um, including SVHK, um, Dialogue in the Dark, um, which are uh, both active in Hong Kong. Uh, Acumen Fund is um, uh, a, a global uh, fund uh, that was based on a portfolio of uh, enterprises that they, um, the nonprofit arm uh, has incubated and supported over time and now they think that these uh, companies are ready to attract real capital and they formed a fund around that. And because um, I'm also very concerned that um, my investments do no harm, uh, I also look for um, fund investments uh, that are um, sustainable and also incorporate um, ESG uh, um, factors into the screening, uh, ESG representing environmental, social, and governance. Um, so I, I believe um, socially responsible investing is also a trend that uh, one is starting to see in Hong Kong. So ultimately, um, what I uh, have tried to do in the last two years of converting my portfolio um, is to uh, maximize the overall uh, impact of my portfolio. Um, so step one was really uh, migrating uh, uh, the portfolio into uh, socially responsible funds. Um, step two is to um, build up um, uh, our internal requirements for meeting ESG requirements um, so that uh, we're trying to do uh, no harm and hopefully you know, some good. Um, and then over time, we hope to increase the percentage share of um, uh, impact investing uh, into more um, 
socially driven uh, ventures um, such as Diamond Cab. Um, we hope that there will be lot, lots more uh, in Hong Kong. Um, so that by integrating all of these factors uh, and all of these um, environmental, social, and economic considerations uh, into my strategy, uh, I am uh, uh, deriving maximum um, impact uh, out of uh, how I allocate my capital. So um, to sum up, um, I, I do believe that building a strong social entrepreneurship ecosystem um, uh, is important. Um, uh, that to me is building up this middle space. Uh, because if you have a vibrant marketplace for services and products and ideas that uh, focus on producing social and environmental good, uh, not only is it meeting some social needs uh, of the community, but I believe it's also um, an appropriate outlet um, for our young people who more and more are looking for um, career opportunities that give them more meaning, that allows them to combine their um, passion for doing some good um, to society, as well as do well for themselves. Um, and I believe that ultimately this is also about giving due value uh, to the non-financial things that uh, we as a community uh, uh, think are important. So with that, I think I will end my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Um, actually, the space of the uh, social investment or impact investing has been kept in evolving. Uh, many investors and foundations are having the attitude of uh, wait and see and see how it's going first. But uh, what I appreciate, Annie, is that um, she would put into action, let's do something first. So in, in, her, in her portfolio, actually, it's building up bit by bit. I think uh, that's something that I think a leader should do is to keep the action going on. Uh, thank you, Annie. So, um, and next, I think I, I'd like to invite Joe to uh, give us um, um, some views from um, what CSL has been done. Actually, I get to know Joe um, uh, since um, um, uh, actually in the dark. Uh, actually, the first time we met, actually, we just hear the, the voice of us because uh, it's an uh, excited workshop of dialogue in the dark. So, uh, but after that, actually, um, I find out a lot, a lot more that CSL has been done, including the concert that is coming up. So, I think I will leave the time for Joe to explain more to you. Thank you very much. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Francis, and, uh, and I have to echo um, what has already been said. It's a, it's a real privilege to be invited here today uh, you know, as, as one of only, I guess, really two foreigners uh, uh, that are presenting. But uh, like everyone else here, uh, it doesn't take long for you to be living in Hong Kong to become the essence and say you know, that I'm actually becoming a Hong Konger. Um, it's also a privilege today because um, this is the first time that uh, anyone outside of our company is seeing a refreshed CSL logo. And so some of you who are long Hong, uh, Hong Kongers are familiar with a real structured, tight, uh, formulatic, uh, the C and a formula and the concept of creating a, sim a simple life. And uh, hopefully you can see that the C is still there and the S is still there, but it's a, it's a, a, a ribbon that we believe in, in the freshness of the color and the vibrancy reflects a, a process that we've actually gone through, uh, which I want to talk a little bit about around the leadership and uh, some surprises I had. But it, it touches into the, also the social responsibility. Um, I was very surprised and I've been working internationally since 1993 uh, in the Czech Republic, five years in Taipei, time in uh, uh, Finland as well as in Germany. And when I came to get the opportunity with CSL, here's a company that's been a lo around a long time, almost 30 years in Hong Kong. And as I uh, started to you know, learn about the company last June as I joined, I was surprised to learn that the things like the vision and the values were in English. And they had never actually even been communicated or discussed in, in Cantonese. And so we started asking the questions uh, of the company of, you know, because uh, you know, every company for profit company actually has to answer the question, um, wh why are we in business besides making a profit? Okay, and, and so that's where we started our conversation about our vision. And then we also asked the question about values. So um, we'll share a little bit of, about that as we go forward. So the next slide. So oh, all right. we're, we're supposed to have two slides, one in Chinese and one in English. Ah, so now I'm going to be really challenged. But let me get my. <laughs> I, I can present Chinese and, and have my slides in English. Do you need translation? Yeah. <laughs> the wonder of technology. Okay. 
So as we're going, you know, it was already mentioned, from a, a corporation that has been known to uh, of our own corporate social responsibility for many, many years, to actually creating what we call a social business. So when we look at our, our new uh, corporate vision statement, it's communications for everyone, connecting everything, and unleashing the potential of human networks. And hopefully for those of you who can, can read the Chinese, uh, get the essence that those, those, those words are more impactful, perhaps, than the English words that I just shared with you. And that is kind of the essence of engaging with 2,000 of our staff and not just, you know, the executive leadership team of our company saying, okay, it's time to, you know, have a new corporate vision statement, you know, create a simple life was nice, uh, but what does it really mean? And so we're really now looking at what we do, and, and it's very important for me. I've been in this industry for, for 30 years, and you know, I, would, I don't even have to ask to raise your hands. How many people have a mobile phone? You know, everyone has one. You know? and most of you, many of you have two. But I challenge you to think about the very first time that you picked up your mobile phone. And um, I can almost guarantee that within the first 24 hours, you said, I love you to someone. Okay, and so when people ask about our industry and what keeps us so excited about it, you know, besides, uh, you know, all the good we do, when I have a bad day, I say, I'm in the business of love. So, you know, that's, uh, there's no greater social responsibility to that. You know, every time you say I love you uh, now on the phone or, or text it or email it to someone, you know, that's part of our greater contribution to society. But, um, you know, our, our business is about, you know, customers and it's about, it's about people. And um, for us, you know, we have three very simple values now. It's to be, to be innovative in everything we do, and that may be breakthrough technology that we're known for, but it's also the small, simple improvements, which is around this concept of customer centricity and, and understanding that there are multiple touch points when we interact with uh, the people who generate the profits that then allow us to, to reinvest not just uh, in our technology, but also, you know, into the social good that we want to do here in our city of Hong Kong. And we have a responsibility to care for our customers, okay? And so, you know, again, we have to think about these touch points. It's not just, you know, our employees, our customers, all of these elements come into business or the business won't survive over time. So again, we're known for delivering our technologies, but also for ser services that not only support the government. Uh, CSL and our sub-brands is, is the largest supplier of communication services to the, the government here in Hong Kong. And we support this uh, digital economy, the, the vibrant uh, energy that goes around just a few uh, kilometers from here in Cyberport in terms of creating uh, a rich digital environment and really pushing Hong Kong as Asia's first world city. So we have multiple brands that also service our society here in Hong Kong. Many of you will be fami familiar with our premium brand, and it's been around the longest, 1010. Um, we hold a premium lifestyle position here in Hong Kong. We deliver services that go beyond what might be expected. As we think about our branding and, and how we match that to society, you know, the premium 1010 brand is about those people who are on a voyage, whether they're on a voyage going beyond Hong Kong, global travelers, the percentage of of people in Hong Kong who spend less than 20% of their time physically in Hong Kong and the 80% of it on the road, this is a lifestyle choice. You know, we have to support that lifestyle choice and make sure that not only our services work well in Hong Kong, but on a global basis. Our partnership with Dialogue in the Dark is, is really uh, the cornerstone of this. Uh, for those of you who have not had the experience, um, you, you have to just go and experience it. Uh, I, I personally, it was uh, uh, my my wife's grandfather was blind, went blind at about um, age uh, 35, and I had a chance to work with him uh, when I was going to university and working part-time in, in his small sh uh, gas station that he owned as a, as a mechanic. And I was, you know, always amazed. And, and Henry hadn't seen a car since 19, uh, about 1959. And I was working for him, not in 1960, but I was working for him in the, uh, in the mid-1970s. And we would have a problem, you know, and uh, we couldn't fix it in the, in the automobile. And we'd tell Hank, we'd say, Hank, come here and stand. And he'd listen to the car, and he'd say, you know, have you thought about this? You know, have you thought about that? And amazing how, you know, his ability, who he couldn't see, but he could still hear, and he could sense, and he could guide us uh, around what to do. And when you go to Dialogue in the Dark, uh, the, the first thing that you'll realize is, is that, you know, we are forced to listen. 
and uh, when we talked about leadership this morning, that's really what leadership is about on all levels. Uh, you know, you have to listen to your environment and listen to each other, and it's a very, very powerful experience, and, and I encourage everyone to do that. Um, so enough for uh, dialogue in the dark. We come to One Two Free. One Two Free was a brand that we launched uh, about 10 years ago. And those of you who remember that, you know, you remember the old the, the the victory or the peace sign. It was it was all about the youth movement. And as we've moved forward, and, and many of the people who were the first users of that brand are now grown up. They have families of their own. You know, this is really what we call our community brand, uh, the heart of Hong Kong. It, it's for everyone in your community. And so as we evolve this brand, we have to reach out to all levels of the community and supporting different segments in the needs of society in Hong Kong. Many of you have heard of the Mobile Link service. You know, um, this is a, an award-winning, a, a global award-winning product. It, it basically helps the, you know, a, uh, our elderly uh, who have trouble be able to be in touch with emergency services. And it's, it's not saying that they're not capable of taking care of themselves, but you know, I, have a, I have an elderly mother, and, and uh, you know, when she falls, it's, it's just good to know that she can push and, and, and there will be someone if, if I'm not there to take that phone call. We also have a, um, a service in terms of bringing mobile broadband to underprivileged students. You know, every, we think of ourselves as a connected community, uh, offering this program in a combination with internet services and, and netbooks and laptops, but actually making sure that the students have a very, very affordable high-speed internet connection is something that we do through our, our One Two Free brand. Um, last but not least, when we think about this, we have uh, our web organic. And it's an instant learning, the mobile power of embracing and unleashing the potential of every single student. There should be no limitation to their access to information so that they can you know, create what they need to and take each of their individual potential and grow and access to what the world has to offer. And most importantly, collaborate. When we think about how communication services have changed in the last 25 years, you know, um, people think, oh, it's, we're reinventing it. And we look at social networking today, we look at Facebook, and I'm old enough to remember, and some of you in the room used to have party lines. And you, you know, what, you'd pick up and you'd have a party line, and you're smiling because you remember it, and people would chat in a chat room because you couldn't have, afford to have a single private line. Well, it's, it's almost kind of going back to the future. You know, people are interacting with their neighbors or their friends, and now these social communities aren't just the people who live close to you on your party line, but those of you here you know, as global citizens, it's the people all around the world that you're connected to through your, your Facebook or your Twitter. Uh, so project reference, again, the, the City Near Citizens Home Safety Association, another support where we're providing uh, a, a free technological, technological support with our experts to the service. Um, a lot of people aren't familiar with the, the, the ethnic prepaid service, and we talk about the migrant workers in, uh, in, in China in the previous presentation. But here in Hong Kong, there's a huge population of ethnic workers that come from overseas. And one of the unique things that we've done is that we've actually you know, partnered with these uh, companies back in the Philippines, in, 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 tel um, in Indonesia, so that we're able to bring their content and their, their services and keep them connected by not just forcing them to, to buy into what Hong Kong has richness, but we keep them connected to their home communities. And we provide a service that wouldn't be available if we uh, weren't engaged in trying to understand those specific needs. And so, you know, many times, you know, we actually will bring to Hong Kong, uh, you know, performers uh, and, and politicians from, you know, the Philippines or Indonesia to address and talk to and interact with the, uh, the migrant workers that are here, providing the domestic help and, and everything else that they do for us here in Hong Kong. So that's our presentation. I want to say one last thing that, as we're thinking about the, the in social responsibility, and we don't talk about this much in Hong Kong, and, and CSL was just recognized by the, uh, our uh, internal association globally for being one of the top 1% of most energy efficient uh, wireless operators in the world. And say, well, you know, what does that mean for us as Hong Kongers and everyone else? Well, you know, we can't control the price of real estate in Hong Kong, and it's going up, you know, very, very rich, high all the time, but we were able to maintain and provide some of the lowest cost and high value in terms of those prices that Hong Kongers pay by, by also focusing on doing the right thing for our environment and having very low cost uh, consumption. Because these towers that we have, everything that we do, that the number one cost that we have besides real estate 
is in fact the energy use. So you can be assured that the green isn't just about the green logo for the company now, but it's about unleashing the innovation of, of 2,000 of our staff and empowering them to think about the environment, to be respectful to all people and everyone in society every day. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, not sure if you noticed or, you noticed or not, um, Joe talked a lot about um, his personal experience. I think he is always putting a perspective from um, the user's angle. How is my mom feeling when I'm, talk, um, I'm seeing these kind of opportunity in the business? And last time when I, uh, if I, if I remember it, uh, in the dark workshop, actually is um, the top 11 executives of CSLs going to the workshop all together. I think these kind of uh, leadership is Joe want to bring into this big, con big corporate in the workplace. I think um, there are a lot more shared. Um, I expect many more questions coming up um, for this. Last but not least, um, Ada, um, thanks for joining us today. I think um, Ada is quite difficult to introduce, actually, I find. Um, um, she is always on the go. A lot of different initiatives, I think, in, as an educator, as a culture builder. And on social innovation, actually, she has done a lot, a lot of work, like M80 Mad, and also a, a number of things. I, I, I think I'll leave some time for Ada to talk about this. Thank you very much. Um, hello everyone, this session is about um, leadership that comes from all sectors, about leadership from bottom up. Um, this session is about um, trying to convince you that social leadership is important. Yesterday I had a talk with Francis and I said, what do you want you know, uh, as an outcome of this session? And he said very quickly, two words, think social. Now I think it is true that in Hong Kong we don't really think social. Uh, you know, there, there's this huge room uh, up one floor and, you know, for those of you who like to think social, we have to come down one floor in a smaller room. So I hope that, you know, <laughs> next year uh, things could be uh, in the reverse. Um, today, you know, in, in a short 10-15 minutes, I want to tell you, you know, my own experience, uh, my own journey, because in the last few years uh, and in different sectors, because I'm a cross-sector person, I have seen a lot of examples of social leadership, of people who have really made a positive impact of this society and others. And I have been inspired by many, many people. So here we go. And everyone can be a change maker. I borrowed this from Ashoka, from Ashoka Foundation. This is what I believe as well. Everybody can be a change maker, no matter where you are from, from you know, when you have a will to do it. Um, from 2004 to 2008, I was the chairperson of the Wan Chai District Council. I have seen great examples of leadership uh, from the residents themselves. In 2004, when Li Tung Street was being um, um, demolished, um, these, these second generation of Wan Chai people got together and said, can we do something about our own community? Can we actually plan our own community? Uh, with the help of professionals, they came up with a plan called a dumbbell plan. Now, this is quite actually a very, very smart plan. They said, okay, you are a, you know, you can demolish uh, the buildings on the two sides of the street, and then you can build tall buildings, and we want to keep a row of tong lao in the middle. So for those of you, for those of us who would like to stay, we can stay in the low, lower stories. Now, uh, this is the first ever residence-led planning scheme in Hong Kong. It went through town planning board, it went through a lot of procedures, unfortunately it failed, but I still think that it changed the way we looked at heritage, it changed the way we looked at preservation and community building. And um, these are really regular people, uh, and um, they are from all walks of life. Now the second example that I saw in Wan Chai um, is from St. James's Settlement and the Blue House. Um, this, uh, the uh, top right-hand corner, is a photo of the Wan Chai Livelihood Place. Now, this is a, a, a residence-run uh, operation, and uh, it, um, uh, it actually displays a lot of old furniture and old knickknacks uh, from the old days, from the 50s and the 60s. Uh, the residents said, you know, we want to show how we lived before. So let's do it, you know. And St. James's Settlement got a, an empty space uh, from the Blue House, and it's still here, and it has cultural tours around Wan Chai, and, um, and this has opened the door, you know, for community-led 
uh, initiatives in um, in in, uh, in culture and heritage, and um, and these are not really, you know, people with a lot of money, not not people with a lot of prestige. Uh, they just want to show us, you know, how they live. Recently, um, I have been inspired by many many social innovations and uh, social enterprises. Uh, uh, the two last speakers talked about dialogue in the dark. Uh, for those of you who still have not been through a dialogue in the dark experience, I really urge you to go. You know, after today, it's uh, we, there is a, an exhibition at, at Mayfu, and but you have to walk through it in the dark. Uh, it is not 10 minutes, it's not 15 minutes, but it is more like one hour. And I think some of you will be quite scared, uh, but you'll be led by visually impaired guides, and then you will see that in the dark, you're actually much weaker than those visually impaired people. Um, another social innovation, um, which I really respect a lot, is um, from a chap called Andrew Yu. He's a young man from Guangzhou. Um, he really loves backpacking, and uh, he goes to the uh, mountainous areas of China a lot. And he realizes, well, like all of us do, uh, that they really need a lot of stuff, like books and um, uh, stationery for uh, schools. Now, a lot of us know that, but we don't have any action. So what he did was he started a website, and he said, let's carry one kg more. And if every one of us carry one kg more to the mountains and deliver them to the schools there, then they will have enough supplies and books. And this web website became a really, really big thing in China now. And a lot of listed companies in China donate stuff to the website so that these young backpackers can carry them to the Yunnan, to Qinghai provinces. Um, it started from really nothing, but it became a big social innovation, and it has solved a big problem for China. You know, moving material to the um, mountainous parts and, uh, and the unreachable parts of China. Good Gym is, is really great fun. Uh, I have been very much inspired by that. This is started by a young person in the UK. Uh, what it is, is it's very simple. Um, there's a website. For those of you who like to jog, you just jog very meaninglessly every day. You know, you just run around and run around with no meaning. So, um, so this website said, come on, run with meaning. So if you sign up, they pair runners with isolated and less mobile elderly people. And the runner will jog to the elderly's home, say hi. Hi, uh, Mrs. Smith, would you like uh, to buy something today? And Mrs. Smith, yes, I would like to buy some groceries and some food, and etc. So give him some money, he ran down to the supermarket, and then he will buy the stuff, and then he will you know, carry it up to the old lady. Thank you very much, and they had a chat, and then he ran home. Now, this is a meaningful run, right? So. Since the establishment of the website, uh, Good Gym has paired up over a thousand runners with elderly people. Now, it doesn't take any, you know, really great, a lot of money for you to start something like that, right? It takes what? It takes creativity, it takes innovation, it takes commitment. And this is what social innovation is all about. You have new solutions to old problems. Now, in Hong Kong, we would actually tell the government, why don't you do something to help these isolated elderly people? But in the UK, you know, a young person thinks of this way, matching runners with isolated elderly. Isn't that fun? So, you know, after I see all these uh, really uh, inspired cases, I say, what, what can I do? Uh, in 2008, I stepped down from being chairwoman of the Wan Chai District Council, um, and I did several projects um, with my NGO, and I really, would really like to build my NGO, which is called the Hong Kong Institute of Contemporary Culture, a cultural and social enterprise. Uh, uh, I started with a very small project. It is called Upcycling. Um, a lot of you know about recycling. You know, you, you put it in the, different, the three different colored bins, uh, but you don't know where they go. Um, upcycling means you take the goods and you try to create products like this. Now, this is all from the rubbish bin. These are all unused material or to be thrown away material, and um, which are now redesigned by designers, by young designers from design schools in Hong Kong, and it can be sold, and people are actually buying them. Okay, now you can see that these are all from old wood and old furniture, and they have been reassembled to be something new and practical to be used. 
um, unused hangers. You can see that um, you know if you put a glass top on it, um, it is really functional and really pretty as well. Uh, this is my favorite one. Um, you know, you use from all this discarded material and, and it is a real plant, real planting. And on top, you can't see it really well, it's a glass top. It is a really nice coffee table. Okay, so, so all these things are now being done by a group of uh, designers and, and another project together with us. And we hope we can expand this. Uh, the airport authority like what we do and we just had an exhibition at Terminal 2 at a big space, um, a vacant shop space uh, at the Hong Kong uh, airport terminal, and we got a lot of uh, positive feedback from that. Um, Make a difference, as Francis said, is, uh, is another project that I started because I see so many inspiring stories. I would like to, you know, tell young people of Hong Kong and Asia, uh, you know, to bring all of these inspired, uh, inspiring people to Hong Kong. So Make a Difference um, is held in January each year, and our tagline is change starts with you. We believe that young people can make a difference, young people can lead change. And Make a Difference, the platform is there to nurture young people to, to have this personal, social, environmental and economic change that they want to lead. Each year um, we have a big annual forum in January and that is attended by 1,200 young people from all over Asia including all 30 provinces in China. And um, you know what happens in the forum? We have many 20-minute talks by inspiring thought leaders. A lot of young people as well. For next January, I have started to invite people already. And, and this good gym project that I talked to you about, the founder will come to Hong Kong. Uh, apart from 20-minute uh, talks, I also have met workshops and chat rooms where you can actually, you know, have really ask questions uh, to a thought leader face to face. Uh, this is a dialogue in silence workshop where you will have to experience silence, you know, like a deaf person. And a most exciting night city challenge where people run through the old streets of, uh, of uh, Kowloon of Hong Kong uh, and is actually like, uh, like an orienteering, uh, you know, in, in an urban area. Uh, we have a Mad Award for Change Makers. It's uh, $150,000 for the grand prize. And uh, we have this website, uh, which is a year-long thing, and um, there are lots of things happening there. Uh, Matt talks online, so like the TED talks, um, you know, we, we can have the, uh, you can actually, you know, go on and, and, and see the Matt talks um, as, as you need. Matt Good Lab is, is a project that we have started this year um, because I want action, you know, I want to see action, like the Good Gym projects. So um, I have, uh, have a sponsor, really, really great sponsors that we have, you know, who are now supporting us to, um, to, uh, to provide uh, support and actions uh, for young people to, to create uh, positive change, to create positive social change. And now I have a lot of teams, I call them change in action teams, uh, which are doing uh, interesting projects and which I can talk to you later about but because of time I can't go into it. And in August, you know, I'm doing something interesting. I'm bringing the Young Foundation and the Global Innovation Academy to Hong Kong and we would have a two-day workshop called Social Innov Innovation 101. And uh, next, next MAT 2012 will be in uh, January. Now, one last word on wh why, why I do this. And, and you have to think about what kind of world do we live in. I think all of you know that uh, our world is flatter, is stickier, is very much connected, uh, is more global yet local. These are all the things that people talk about from time to time. Um, issues are getting more and more complicated and you really cannot just rely on the government to solve them. You know, we also have our responsibility uh, to come up with new solutions and innovative solutions uh, and rather just to rely on top-down methods because creative leadership, social leadership really comes from bottom up. So a world, we are now living in a world where social innovation is as important as business innovation. And I hope you do take that away and let's all do something about that. Uh, one last point, you know, and everybody can be a change maker. I refer to this. Now this is a school that I have founded. I'm not going to talk about the school, but I just want to tell you of this innovation that one of my students, Carson, did that won him a prize to the Arctic. 
to the Arctic for $90,000, including all the gear, so that he would be kept warm. Now, what, he, what did he do? We have five stories in our school, and he designed a chute whereby, you know, all the students can throw their plastic bottles and cans down and down and down. It is really artistic. So from the fifth floor to the, to the ground floor. And so every single student in our school now is attracted by this artistic installation. But this is, but this is a recycling bin. It's basically a recycling bin. And this artistic installation won him a $90,000 prize to the Arctic. And he's traveling in a few weeks. So uh, with that, I want to say everybody can be a change maker. Thank you. You can absolutely feel the energy, right? I think we need more social leaders like Ada in our society to make changes. Um, I think, Ada, we are talking about changing the world here. We absolutely need to talk about the change in the room next year so that we don't need to go down one story down <laughs> for this section. And uh, we have some time for questions. But uh, of course, as a facilitator, I have the privilege to take the first shot. Um, I always want to ask about the motivation, um, the intention. Um, what is, is there any one incident or one thing that made three of you feel that, oh, I have to do something uh, with my capacity to do something. For example, Joe, in specific, in, as an organization, somebody uh, give you some crazy ideas. Um, why you think it's, it's not profitable? Why should I do this? Uh, these kind of things. Um, please, any of you. Maybe Joe, you, you can start first. Well, Francis, I can, I can actually say you know, that, that all of these projects that we presented this morning didn't come from executive leaders. You know, it was uh, ideas that the employees came forward to and, and talked to someone and said, you know, is, is, it, is this an opportunity? So you know, clearly, uh, as we talked about the model this morning, is it, it, it isn't the position of authority that leadership comes from. It's really uh, anybody who is able to uh, you know, present an idea and, and to you know, talk to you know, their peers and everyone else can bring about a change in, in uh, whether it be a business or any type of an organization. So this is something that we try to foster and we, we communicate a lot to our employees that, uh, you, know, um, you know, if you have an idea, uh, bring it forward. And, and one of the things that, you know, for my having worked around the world and, and worked in, in many different cultures and having been in Asia and then left and come back, uh, we still, I still see that sometimes uh, due, due to the, the Confucian nature of, of, of some of the education still that, you know, it's still a challenge that we face, uh, you know, very often, um, you know, in our company is that people have good ideas and they, they, they keep their mouth shut, you know, or, or they think their idea is to figure out what the boss thinks is a good idea. And that's probably one of the, the big challenges that we face time and time again. Um, it's very simple. Despite all its flaws, I, I love the place I live in. You know, I love Hong Kong and I want Hong Kong to change. And if I can do a little bit about that, you know, I would be very happy to do so. Um, I don't know that there was any one incident um, or happening that, that, um, caught, that launched me uh, into exploring this uh, middle space, so to speak. Um, I did mention that um, earlier on, I, I used to think very much in the bifurcated model uh, of you know, doing well versus doing good. Um, and I, I guess I, I started looking at how I can do good um, and came across the concept of um, social entrepreneurship and the space in the middle and uh, thought that was a great combination of, um, uh, of these two extremes. Um, and for me, it's particularly uh, um, exciting because um, that's where I feel I um, can play a role um, in terms of mobilizing um, the resources that I have. Um, I won't tell you the longer story. I mean, of course, there's a lot of background to um, my personal experiences and, and, and such. Um, but uh, I came across um, you know, different groups of people in Hong Kong who are trying to make things happen. Um, I think it's something that it, um, uh, the time has come for. Um, and I um, just wanted to do my bit uh, to help make things happen. Um, like Ada, you know, I do care a lot about 
Hong Kong and where uh, Hong Kong is going. Um, and it's just one way that I can express my values um, through the way that I um, uh, use my resources, both in terms of uh, money, time, and energy. I think we can uh, collect a few questions first so that um, many more people can speak and then we can uh, respond to all of the questions. Hi, I'm uh, Whitman, uh, Whitman Hong from the Y Elites Association. It's a general question, but particularly maybe any in Joe can answer a bit more. Um, what puzzles me is we're seeing a lot of these kind of social initiatives in, in the society. Some, I mean, Annie did a very good academic view of, you know, from one side to the other side. Um, but what puzzles me is there are certain commercial organizations on one side doing a lot of good things like donations, helping the poor, education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the same time, their own commercial activities, in my perspective and in a lot of other consumers' perspective, are very far away from having this kind of commu uh, you know social responsibility. So. I don't know what what should be the solution. I mean, should we embrace these organizations? Should we? I mean, there's. I don't want to mention names, but there's re some reason. Um, charity uh, funds that ask people to go and vote um, to, for the best projects. I mean, to me, that's the cheapest way of marketing. That's not really, you know, um, a charity. And what I'm seeing is, is there's a blur boundaries here between leveraging leveraged marketing and CSR and real social um, initiatives. So how are we going to deal with this? Thanks. Okay, I think we'll, we can collect a few more questions. We can uh, respond all together uh, over there. My name is uh, Stanley Chan from Lens Industry. So my question is uh, actually to, to Joe, because uh, you are running a pirate company and how do you persuade your your goal or your personal thinking like having having the the student to use a very cheap price to to use the bot brand service because as a pirate company the executive or your boss the benchmarking is the dollar so how, how do you how do you persuade the whole organization to accept this idea and and implement it Cut that bonus. No, 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 I think I'm joking. Uh, I think uh, Joe has a better answer. Um, any more questions? Here and there. Oh, hi. Um, this is Steve Chan from Characters. And I just have uh, one question for Ada, uh, Ms. Ada Wong. And uh, actually, I'm really pretty excited about you know, the projects you mentioned, uh, helping the community uh, for the betterment of the life. But I'm just wondering, you know, like I'm sure that you there there are quite a lot of like challenges that you faced in the past, and I was just wondering, you know, how you over, overcome it, and what are these challenges? Okay, one over here. Yep, thank you. Um, I really appreciate all the speakers and in different fields that um, it's coming all together um, about the social innovation and enterprises. Um, I just want to address a question to Joe that. Um, I really see the vision of transforming the companies from CSR purely to um, the idea of a social responsible companies, as what you said, Annie. Um, that's why um, I think there, there should be more companies like CSL. But what do you think is the factors and how do you think that from the perspective of a company's leader or um, a president or a CEO, how would you say how do you transform the companies like that? Is it coming from the goodwill of that particular leader, that particular leader, or um, what factors could change this phenomenon from CSR to social um, resp um, responsible companies? Thank you. All right. Uh, I think we had just chance for one round of questions. So if you have any, please. Um, okay. All right, thanks. Um, uh, we could talk about all the things that are about the balance, the blended value thing, and a private company, and an overall community. Any challenge for that? Um, maybe any? You can go first. Um, I think from, from um, the perspective of um, an investor, uh, I think uh, Whitman's uh, question um, addresses, well, what really is CSR? 
um, in a way, right? Um, is it just uh, greenwashing? You know, some people talk about greenwashing, which is, you know, you claim to be an environmentally uh, friendly uh, company, but are you actually implementing that or are you just, you know, uh, mostly rhetoric? Um, I think this is where um, um, socially responsible investing comes in. Um, businesses uh, ultimately have to respond to the market and to investors. Um, and I think uh, by um, promoting uh, the concept of socially responsible investing and eventually making it uh, um, uh, making these investments available to uh, on a retail level means that you're allowing um, investors to make the choice. If you have two companies uh, in the same line of business, but one is really practicing CSR, incorporating um, social responsibility or environmental responsibility into its business model versus another one that's just doing greenwashing, um, you can, through your investment dollars, um, pick the one that you want to invest in uh, to invest in, and that's how you send a message eventually, right, to, to the companies that um, this is what people value. Um, so, um, and it's for that reason that, you know, I migrate my portfolio into responsible investments, um, and I'm trying to do my bit to promote that um, in, in Hong Kong and in, in Asia. Um, but um, I, I, it also um, has to do with, I think, um, company management um, being, uh, well, to use um, Professor Dean Williams' terms, you know, being um, able to face the entire reality and not pick and choose what reality they want to deal with. Um, you know, uh, I think um, as responsible investors, when you talk to companies, a lot of times they'll say, well, you know, we have to uh, keep our shareholders happy, and so making money is the most important thing. Um, but that's because they're only seeing a partial reality. Right? That's how I would put it. I think your your question uh, uh, was you know how do I make ends meet right so where 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 where, do the, where does the money come from? Well, the uh, you know for for all the projects I do, I um, I'm trying to be a you know a cultural enterprise, which means that I hope that uh, you know I can you know have income from different sources and uh, the whole enterprise can be sustainable. So at the moment, uh, some of the projects uh, are partly funded by the Hong Kong government, and, um, and then there are a lot of corporate sponsors, and then I also charge uh, you know, admissions income for all the events and all the projects. So um, at the moment, it looks all right, but you know, to be sustainable, I have to look for a model uh, that would bring in a lot more regular income, and that might be in the form of courses like, you know, like Social Innovation 101 and, and uh, other things like that. But um, you know, it is difficult uh, for, uh, for us uh, to, to, to find such a model. Uh, in the USA, for example, crowdsourcing is, is, a, is a much used model nowadays. I would like to try crowdsourcing one day. Uh, you know, when, when MAD is uh, more well known, but you know, we are only in our third year, so we would rely on the, you know, support from all sources. And your support is welcome. <laughs> so um, I guess the, I'll try to answer several of the questions, but the first one was about this concept of blur and, and, and in fact is, is social responsibility just a marketing gimmick? Uh, I guess maybe that was part of the essence of your question. And, and, and um, you know, clearly, from our perspective, you know, um, I, I can say from you know, in my heart, you know, no. I mean, you know, this is you know, the idea that we would uh, present one of our brands along with Dialogue of the Dark is not about uh, getting people to say, well, I'm going to buy that brand because you know you're there. It's basically uh, get, you know, it's about giving back, and, and, it, and it isn't this not just a sense of a donation or a sponsorship so that you know Dialogue in the Dark exists. But it's uh, it's in a broader sense. Uh, you know, when we we developed the uh, the product for the elderly, you know, there was no product in in the world that did that. There's there's you know no profit to us in doing that other than an opportunity to you know give back to the community. So you know, it, from our perspective, it isn't about um, you know uh, partnering to you know just grow the bottom line of the business, but it is about uh, understanding that we have a, a greater responsibility beyond making a profit. Uh, and so that's the, to your question. Um, uh, the question here about you know, uh, you know CSL is a, is a, a private company. Uh, our, our parent uh, is, is a, 
Um, you know, Telstra Corporation owns 76% of us, so they're a publicly traded company. And um, the good news with that is that uh, they, Telstra, in a broader sense, uh, you know, gives us the flexibility. And in, in once we identify and say, okay, um, this is what we can deliver to a profit, um, then we have a lot of freedom to do whatever we need to do to serve our communities. And so if we end up, uh, you know, having an opportunity to invest more than we may have budgeted uh, in our social programs, uh, then, then we do that. Uh, but it's not just about the investments we make, it's about the day-to-day -day, uh, way we run our business as well. Um, so we, we're you know, fortunately given a lot of freedom from that perspective from uh, our major shareholder. Um, and I think that the last question that was uh, directed to me is that, you know, you know, does this concept, you know, start with a leader? Um, and what will happen. And I think it's, it's, it's true of, of any uh, business leader. And again, there's been a lot of uh, things written over the years uh, by people at Harvard and different case studies about, you know, the, is it an individual leader and, or is it really the essence, uh, is it built into the, uh, the core of the business? And so I think that that's really the, the model because um, I live by the philosophy in business, you know, any one of us could get hit by the tram tomorrow. Um, and so if the company is dependent on a single leader, then the company is not going to survive. And, uh, you know, uh, I also believe that, uh, you know, when, when I look at an individual person in a level of authority, um, if that person thinks that they can do everyone else's job better, then somebody's really in the wrong job. And it's probably the leader, okay? Because, you know, because if, you, you know, if I can tell everyone that I could do their job better, then I ought to be doing that job, not the job of, of the leader. So, you know, to me, this is about building, you know, a culture and reinforcing it and making sure that the ownership exists in 2,000 of the staff, not just in, in a handful. I think um, you will all see there are many more opportunities for practicing social leadership. I think we can use our mind to have more innovative ways to think about what we can do. And we can, with our own capacity, we can uh, build up enough muscle for exercising the power to get this done. And I think more importantly it would be our passion, our passionate heart to start to think about this, to, to see how we can do about this. So I hope that you enjoy this section, the film that we screened here in this, uh, in this room. And then uh, I, I know all of you think about uh, coffee, think about the next section, but before that, by the time you leave, think social, please. Thank you very much. <laughs>